In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. Greetings and a hearty welcome to you, my friend. Our program is devoted to searching the Scriptures for the best way to live that man has ever known, the way that Jesus taught the way that was readily received and the way that turned the world around in the first century when it was first preached. I believe it would do that today if it were taught again as it was then and if it were taught often enough where people can hear it. That's what we're trying to do and we've come a long way, but we've a long way to go. With God's blessings, we'll do it. I'm glad you've joined us today. I pray you'll be blessed. The most generally accepted scientific theory of the origin of the universe is called the Big Bang Theory, that it was all created without design by a primeval explosion some 15 billion years ago and without any intervention by supernatural force. It's a theory, remember, and has been in trouble for about the last uh, three decades, being rejected by some of the scientific community and seriously questioned by many others. Then. Perhaps you remember that in April of this year, there was the announcement in all of the news media of that, what was termed by physicist Joel Premack of the University of California at Santa Cruz as one of the major discoveries of the century. In fact, he said it's one of the major discoveries of science. It was this discovery of some primordial gases about 500 million light years out into space which seemed to support the Big Bang Theory of the beginnings and give it new life in the scientific community. I was interested in it because the chief assumption of the Big Bang Theory is that uh, in, in the beginning, all matter in the universe was compressed into one tiny, unimaginable, dense sphere, smaller than a period on a typewriter at the end of a sentence. According to an explanation of an article by Lee Siegel, of the United Press and published in the Los Angeles Times Friday, April 24th this year. The ball exploded at a temperature of trillions of degrees, launching all this matter out in the expansionary course it continues to follow to this day. Within the first millionth of a second, he said, after the explosion, quarks and other exotic particles combined to form portions and uh, protons and neutrons, and most of which were just as rapidly annihilated by collisions with antiprotons and antineutrons, releasing their energy in the form of light waves. And the discovery of certain of these light waves seemed to provide evidence to support the Big Bang Theory. After Ken Heldbrand leads us in a hymn of praise to God, I'll be back for more on this subject. Sweet Part of the 33rd Psalm is going to be the scripture reading for today. We're going to begin reading at verse 6 and read down through verse 9. By the word of the Lord 
were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Now let's with bowed heads go into the presence of God in prayer. Loving Father, we are so grateful that we have the privilege of coming to you in prayer and offering to you the thanksgiving and petitions of our hearts. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we approach you now with thanksgiving for this world and the beauty of it in which we, you have permitted us to live. We realize, Father, that you've given us the trust for the care of it, and we pray that um, as we learn more about it that we'll be more appreciative and put more effort into the care of the world in which we live. Preserve it and its beauty, not only for our generations, but for generations unborn, if it's your will that the world should stand that long. Father, we're thankful for this beautiful passage that we read a moment ago telling us how it all came to be, and we pray that you'll bless our studies of it today. Amen. Science is probably the most powerful human force at work in the world today. There's hardly a person living, even in the remotest and least developed country of the world, whose life hasn't been influenced to some degree or some measure. And certainly in our country, we're deeply indebted to modern science and technology for our quality and longer life on the earth. We wouldn't want to diminish from the glory of its contribution to better living for the human race in the least. The broad definition of science or scientific is knowledge to make known. How this knowledge comes about is referred to as the scientific method introduced long ago by Sir Francis Bacon. Science in modern times seeks factual information from the many uses of the scientific method. And that information may be stored in computers or other retrieval uh, devices. But science has its limitations. Intellectual historian Crane Britton describes those limitations. He says, science, both in the sense of a body of accumulated scientific knowledge and in the sense of a way of 
going to work on problems, meaning, of course, the scientific method, is not concerned with metaphysics. Science, as science, he says, makes no attempt to answer, does not even ask the big questions, what am I, why am I here, and so on. Questions about or of human destiny, of God's ways to man, of right and wrong and good and bad. He says, as soon as the scientist asks and tries to answer any of the big questions, he's ceasing to behave as a scientist. He is at the very least doing something additional and he's probably doing something different. To make a long story short, the scientist is the best equipped to examine raw data and to organize it for use by philosophers and, and uh, thinkers in other fields who for thousands of years have applied human logic to such data. Christian thinkers are, the, are best equipped to compare scientific data with revealed truth in the Bible. But if the scientist insists on getting into philosophy or religion, he can no longer claim to being working in pure science. That just means then that there are some questions science just can't answer. For example, science cannot know because it's limited to materialistic data that no creator had a part in the origin of the universe and life in it. It can theorize, and that's what the Big Bang theory is. It's a theory, but it cannot know. And while the spatial discoveries we talked about a while ago may give some credence to that theory, it's still a theory. So science has not proven because God is beyond the scientific domain that the first sentence of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, is not true. There really should be no conflict between religious faith grounded in the Bible and the natural sciences. Just as the one mentioned earlier, science has made many very valuable discoveries of realities in the world around us which give glory to God. As David said in the 19th Psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. It's when the scientist becomes the philosopher or the religionist that conflict arises. Faith's quarrel is really not with science then, but with philosophy. The use or the meaning given to the factual information assimilated by the scientist. But so much of modern public thought is so very bound up in the evolutionary theory that I'd like to spend the remainder of our time today in a discussion of the present status of that theory. I've been profitably engaged in the reading of a 1991 book titled Darwin on Trial by Philip E. Johnson, a Berkeley law professor specializing in the logic of arguments. Johnson has written a most telling criticism against the evolutionary hypothesis of Charles Darwin and those who continue to hold uh, on to those theories today. Even some who would like to cling to evolution in one form or another, as displeased as they are with what he says, admit that t the telling force of Johnson's arguments against it. It's clear that Johnson knows what the issues really are between science and faith or evolution and faith because he doesn't attack the work of pure science, which as we mentioned earlier, deals with data and its organization, but the philosophy based on evolutionary theory. Johnson's book is a reminder to science that there is a lot of difference in scientific fact and theories like evolution that are masqueraded as fact. If science uses evolution to mean limited changes in nature, there's no problem, but if evolution is taken to mean that based on limited verifiable changes, science can explain the origin of nature, including life itself, the theory has overstepped its boundaries. In addition, no real credence is given to the biblical account of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 and in Psalms 33 and others as we read from Psalms 33 a little while ago. Men and women of faith will not give up their beliefs that easily. 
an evolution that claims to explain origins of the universe, the Big Bang Theory, or the development of man from lower forms of life must be rejected by Christians who honor the biblical revelations in such matter. If all living species descended from common ancestors in small steps over millions of years, as the Darwinist says, then there must be evidence somewhere of the intermediate forms of life, what are often called the missing links. In human beings, for example, or I should say if human beings, for example, arrived late on this planet, courtesy of the lower forms of life, then evidence of those forms and their intermediate steps must exist somewhere. But despite all the efforts of evolutionists to unearth them, the missing links are still missing. Charles Darwin himself was puzzled about the absence of fossil intermediates. He said, nature may almost be said to have guarded against the frequent discovery of her transitional or linking forms. Modern Darwinists are giving more serious thought to this problem today. When discussing an idea, it's helpful to get beneath the surface of it and get beneath the, the shall we say, the surface material and, and look for the bottom line. The demands of us then today are that when boiled down, to its purest essence, most evolutionary thought is cloaked in a philosophy called naturalism. An understanding of naturalism then enables us to see more clearly the ideas that fuel the evolutionary debate. Naturalism holds that one, all things exist that exist are matter or material. There is no spirit, therefore God does not exist. Astrophysicist Carl Sagan says it in few words. He said, the cosmos is all that is or ever has or ever will be. Well, that also denies the existence of the mind since naturalism speaks only of a brain. Well, then, of course, the second thing is that everything happens in the universe is due to the universe, not anything or anyone above or beyond it, no God. Even if God should exist, naturalists have denied him a place in his own creation. Third, human beings are chemical machines only. There is no spirit in man. And if everything we do is determined by chemical reaction and interaction, then man is merely an animal. Then too, history has no purpose. Everything happens only by chance, not according to a grand design as would be in the case of the existence of God, but purely by chance. Well, we could talk about other beliefs of naturalism. And you notice I did say beliefs, for they are beliefs, not facts. But let's consider how acceptance of these ideas relate to our life here on earth, your life and mine today, right now. All right? If everything is matter and there is no spirit, then everything that's called nature came into existence by mere chance. Evolution assumes then that all forms of life on earth came from the earliest forms of life whose fossils are absent, and it must follow that the earliest forms of life came from no life at all. Hence, we humans are all matter and in no significant way superior to any animal life forms on the earth. The necessary conclusion is that human life is no more valuable than the life of another animal. So child abuse, wife beating, muggings, murder, killing of our own preborn or newborn babies, euthanasia, that is, the murder of the sick, the maimed, the non-productive, the unwanted, the poor, the elderly, whoever they might be. Suicide and assisted suicide and all these things are different forms of animal abuse. As a matter of fact, the advocates of some of this behavior 
argue that we show compassion to injured or sick animals by putting them to sleep. Why not show the same compassion to humans? After all, are but animals. People are and do what they believe. Could that be an explanation for some of the things that we're hearing a lot about in our society today? Another thought comes to me. If history has no purpose, as naturalists and evolutionists believe, then mankind is here by pure chance. And there's no purpose or meaning to life at all. What a discouraging thought that is. Does anybody really believe that? Well, Bertrand Russell once said, man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving. His origin, his growth, his step, uh, his hopes, his fears, his loves, his beliefs, are but the outcome of accidental collocation of atoms. No fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual beyond the grave. And the whole temple of man's achievements must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. Well, obviously, a lot of others believe it who could not express it as eloquently as he did. But when our public education system is rife with the teaching of naturalism and evolution, not as theory, but as fact, is it any wonder? Instead of pointing people to philosophy or science to direct their lives, we are leading men to Jesus Christ, whose way is the best thing that's ever happened to the human family. By faith, we understand that the worlds were created by God, God's pronouncement, so that it's been, that the things that are seen were made of things that are not visible. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 matter came from non-matter, if you prefer. By the command of an intelligent and almighty God, things came into existence. We believe Jesus Christ is the way to the Father. So we encourage you today to believe in Him as God's Son. Form and fashion your life by His teachings, beginning with being baptized into Him for the forgiveness of your sins. Your life will be different and you can help us make a difference in the world around us. If I may assist you, please call on me. Dear Father, we're thankful for your love and care for us and the plan of redemption you provided for us in Jesus. We thank you for his superior way of living. Bless it now to our understanding and lives. We pray in his name. Amen. God. Scientists, as long as they perform as scientists, discover and help us all understand more about this grand universe in which we live, which is the handiwork of God to whom belongs the glory.
It's when they cease to be scientists and become philosophers or religionists who deny the existence of God, the sanctity of human life, and purpose in the universe that we must disagree with them. I'm firmly convinced that this is Natu that this naturalistic, materialistic public mind which we've developed in this century in our public education system and through the entertainment and information media is directly responsible for the chaotic conditions we're experiencing in our society right now. And I'm just as convinced that the solution to those many problems is the return to the Lord's way. These are not social problems. They're social challenges to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we must accept the challenge to seek a return to New Testament Christianity in our very own generation. I'm glad you've been with us today. I hope you feel like our time together has been well spent and you've been blessed by something that we've said or done. Our program is presented in this area by your caring Christian friends in Churches of Christ. We want only to do good and no harm at all to a single person you can say thanks to the people who bring you these programs by worshiping with the Church of Christ near you and by telling them you appreciate their participation in this ministry. Churches of Christ are locally autonomous, so the congregations who work with us do so of their own choice. And we're grateful for every one of them because, you see, that's the reason we never harass you for money. And all the materials that we offer to you are free because of the participation of these many congregations in the churches of Christ. We do it because we love you and because we care. We want to share the gospel message, the good news message of Jesus Christ to as many of you as we possibly can during our lifetime. <coughs> if you'd like a printed copy or an audio cassette tape of today's program titled Science and Faith, please address your request to In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Once again, that address is Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Or you may call us on our toll-free telephone number. That number is 1-800-321-8633. 1-800-321-8633. If the line's busy, hang up and call again a little bit later. And please give us a few days to fill your request with as many as we receive. It does take some time. These are free. No one will ask you for a contribution. You'll not be put on a mailing list and solicited for funds later. Thanks for joining us today. Do it again next week, will you? God bless you. We do love you.